a nice drive, though. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. It does a little bit. <laughs> well, at least you'll get good gas mileage. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Well, good evening, everyone. It's time to get started here, and uh, we're here tonight to together to worship God, to praise Him, learn more about Him. Are we in the book of uh, Ruth again? All right, last probably last last one. Great, can't wait. <laughs> all right, so God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. Has he put a song of praise in your heart? I hope so. Here we go. God is good all the time. Put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good god is good all the time if you're walking through the valley there are shadows all around do not fear he will guide you he will keep you safe and sound oh for he has promised to never leave and his word is true God is good all the time for the song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine God is good God is good all the time if you're walking through the valley there are shadows guide you, he will keep you safe and sound, oh for he has promised to never leave you, no forsake you, and his word is true, God is good all the time, for the song of praise in his heart of mine, God is good all the time, through the darkest night, his light will shine, God is good, God is good, God is good. time and we just thank you for your goodness thank you for your love thank you for your grace and mercy in our lives lord just give us your wisdom give us your discernment especially in these days of so much deception uh, going on out there lord just keep us uh, in your word keep us uh, walking with you abiding in you we just thank you for it thank you for that we can be here tonight with uh, other believers lord that we could just uh, Sing praises to you, worship you, and song. Lord, just be with uh, Brother Don as he gives the message tonight in the book of Ruth. And uh, that's so, it's been so good so far, Lord. And we just, uh, we've learned so much. And we just thank you for Don and his willingness to serve you. Uh, just be with him, Lord. Just give him the words to say. And we praise you for it. And so, Lord, we just uh, give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Finally, our fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The old rugged cross.
thinking of us Lord thank you for being willing to come to this earth to die for the penalty of our sins when we look to Jesus when we turn our eyes upon him it just seems that uh, the earth just grows strangely dim and uh, we just see him as the way he is just you know he, boy, he just died for us and we see his glory just to think about what he has done for us. So we need to turn our eyes always upon Jesus.
and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth light of his glory and grace. Tonight as we come to the table for communion, we do it in remembrance of him. We remember his love. In spite of our disobedience, in spite of our sin, God loves us. A love that is beyond our comprehension. God proved out his love by giving his son on the cross. There's no doubt that God loves us. Just look to the cross. The greatest gift, the greatest illustration of love in the world is the cross. God said from the cross, I love you. You and I were saved by the cross. The Lord loves us so much that he gave his son to die on the cross. It's just more than a feeling. Love as a verb. In that God did something. And while yet we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our Heavenly Father loves us so much. So much that he sent his one and only sinless son to the cross to die for us. Christ took the sin of the world and put it on his shoulders. All the sin, our sins, he bore them on the cross. Yes, God loves us. I have no doubt. And we do this in remembrance of him. The Lord Jesus on the night he, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Bowing down before 
your holy throne Lifting holy hands to you As I pledge my love anew I worship you in spirit I worship you in truth Make my life a holy praise unto you Bended knee I come, with a humble heart I come, bowing down before your holy throne, lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love anew. I worship you in spirit. I worship you. My life a holy praise unto you. I make my life a holy praise unto you. Thank you, Randy. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for us. That you see something good in us. So much so that you would sacrifice your one and only perfect son on the cross for us. So that we would be acceptable to you. So that we would be able to be in your presence. We're so thankful that you love your creation and we are part of your creation made in your image Lord we th thank you for your word and how your word draws us closer to you and when we are gathered together in your word it draws us closer to one another Thank you for this body of believers, this foundation of our little church. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time together as we are in your word, finishing up this wonderful book that you gave us in Ruth. Amen. always humbling to stand before you all so a little quick review before we get finish off the book but um, what we spoke about last week uh, Boaz and the closer relative complete their legal transaction I don't know if you remember, remember the shoe exchange thing right and the man officially withdraws his claim and Boaz buys Naomi's land. He announces his marriage to Ruth and declares his intention to provide an heir in the name of Ruth's late husband, Emelik. The elders and the people gathered to watch as they witness this transaction. Then they bless Boaz and Ruth in the future and their future children. And last week we stopped at around verse 13 in the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth, but tonight we'll pick up and go back a couple verses at verse 11. And all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of, whom, both of whom built the house of Israel. 
And may you achieve wealth in Ephrath and become famous in Bethlehem. As a worthy man, it seems unlikely Boaz had not married before. Because if he had sons, it would make more sense for Boaz to have Ruth marry one of them. But the text doesn't say. In all of the genealogies that mention Boaz, Obed is the only son mentioned. Verse 12. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore Judah through the descendants whom the Lord will give you by this young woman. The people's blessings come true. Ruth will give birth to Obed, and Obed will be the father of Jesse, and Jesse will be the father of Israel's greatest king, David. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and they had relations together, and the Lord enabled her to to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Once again, God gave Israel the Israelites food, and the famine was over. And Naomi made the choice to return to Bethlehem. And Ruth made the choice to come with her mother-in-law and take care of her. And Boaz made the choice to join in with Ruth in her plan to care for Naomi. God completed the work by giving a son. That son led to King David, who led to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. What if God had not intended Ruth into his, in his work and she had not responded? If he had used more traditional family lines, we wouldn't have seen this story about loving kindness and self-sacrifice, family loyalty, and a Moabite woman in the bloodline of our Savior, Jesus. Verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. Now the subject of his name is not clear. Is it talking about God? Completing the phrase, blessed is the Lord? Or does it refer to Obed beginning, may he also be to you one who restores life? Or is it referring to Boaz, who was the more immediate redeemer? The English Standard Version Bible is inconclusive. The New American Standard and the New International Bible say that it's Obed. One version translated as may and may he call your name in Israel. So since Obed means servant or worshiper, that would make sense. The New English uh, translation points out that the pronoun he in referring to redeemer in the New King James refers to restorer. Now I think it's Obed who the name will be famous in all of Israel. Now Obed isn't mentioned in the scripture again outside of genealogies, but the fact that we know his name means the blessing did actually come true. Verse 15. May he also be to you one who restores life and sustains your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better than seven sons, 
has given birth to him. The book of Ruth is a beautiful example of God fulfilling his plan, both for Naomi and Ruth. For myself, I believe that sometimes, most of the time, I am completely unaware that the Lord is even working in my life. Ruth, the great grandmother of King David. And then that actually makes her related to Jesus. But Naomi is not directly related to Jesus. However, her husband, Emelik, is because he was a close relative to Boaz and Boaz was Ruth, Naomi's kinsman redeemer. But without Naomi returning to Bethlehem and bringing Ruth with her, neither one would be able to fulfill their destiny. So it's important. It's so important to remember that sometimes God calls us to places we may not understand. He may take us down roads that, that we would never ever choose for ourselves. What can we learn from Naomi in the book of Ruth? Well, first is that God is sovereign. This means God has complete authority and control over all human beings and every aspect of the universe. It also means that luck and good fortune have no place in discussion about our Heavenly Father. But what if God is not sovereign? If God is not sovereign, we can't be confident of our salvation. We can't trust that the gospel is the only true gospel, that his salvation is real, that his way is the right way. For if God is not sovereign, the desires of Satan may supersede God's will and the plan of the devil may outrival, outrival his. And the whispers of the enemy may take precedence over the plan in your life. Unless God is sovereign, our very salvation is in doubt. If God is not sovereign, we cannot be confident that there is meaning in our sufferings, in our struggles. We have no assurance that the difficulties that we endure are actually consistent with his will. Unless God is sovereign, we have no reason for hope as we look into the future. If God is not sovereign, we cannot be confident in our evangelism, the Great Commission. We may be prone to take credit when others believe the gospel message and prone to give blame when others fail to receive it. If God is not sovereign, we'll be prone to take credit even for our own salvation. If God is not sovereign, we cannot be confident that we will remain in the faith. We have no assurance that we would not be swayed to another teaching, that we would be drawn away from and go to another faith. We have no assurance that God would be proven true when he says, I will never leave or forsake you. 
unless God is sovereign, we may completely reject the faith and be lost forever. If God is not sovereign, we cannot be confident that Christ will return through God has accomplished that Christ will be revealed from the heaven and the almighty angels with him. But what if another being with greater authority can shut down God's plan or deny God's desire? Unless God is sovereign, we look into the future with uncertainty and wrath rather than confidence and with hope. Hope. But if God is sovereign, we can be confident in our salvation, confident that there is meaning in our suffering, confident that our evangelism will be effective, confident that we will remain in the faith, confident that Christ will return. Confident in that all that God is, all that he does, all that he says, and all that he has promised. God is sovereign. There is no doubt about it. God is sovereign. Way back, there's a, I think he's a pastor, Heidelberg. This is an old quote, but I'm, I liked what he said. So I'm, he said this. Our faith is rightly fixed in the God who upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by the hand of our Heavenly Father. And because God is good, we can have confidence in his absolute and loving control over every aspect in our lives. When we trust, trust in our Father, so, Father so, uh, so, sovereignty, thank you, Lord, <laughs> we stand on two assurances. First, is that he is intimately involved in our daily life. No matter what, he never stops proving and protecting and caring for all believers. He knows what we need for today and for tomorrow. The second is that the Lord will work everyday circumstance for our benefit without exception. When life gets hard and more demanding, our confidence may waver. But scripture promises that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. Wait a minute. Let's dig into Romans 8.28 and go down a little bit of a rabbit trail here. Things you may not have noticed about Romans 8.28. Now it's a passage that many of us remember it like this. That Romans 8.28 says, it promises that all things work together for our good. But what the passage actually says is this, that we know that 
in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So at first you might say, wait, wait, what? How can things like death and disease work together for our good? The fact remains that there are some really crummy things in the world and in our lives. And many of them just can't be explained away or be given a silver lining or put lipstick on it. I mean, how can God take chronic anxiety or depression and work that for our good? What about divorce? Death of a loved one? A miscarriage? War? Earthquakes? Tsunamis? The list could go on and on. Romans 8.28 says that God uses all things for our good. Not that all things are good. Big difference. Not things that all things are good. So no matter how optimistic you are, sometimes things just stink. Stinky stank. No matter what the days of sunshine and buttercups will at some point become hurricanes and poison oak. I mean, nobody has a get out of jail card on this. Things like famines and the opioid epidemic and fires and human trafficking, they're all awful. But our God is more powerful. He is more powerful than all the forces of evil and all the rotten things that happen in our lives. Remember that God took death itself and used it to redeem all of humanity. We celebrated that. He reached down into the depths of our brokenness and began our restoration. One of my many hobbies is tinkering with my old 1928 Model A truck. And I don't consider myself to be an expert, but I know people who are. Most of them don't restore cars for the money. In fact, when restoring an old car, you often put more time and money into it than you can get out of it. But like me, these folks do it because they love their old cars. I have a good friend who saved an old rust bucket junkie junkyard 1931 Model A coupe clunker. It was a rust bucket pile. But when he was finished with it, it was and it is better than when it rolled off the assembly line. Better than new. The paint is better. The interior is better. It is even mechanically superior to the original factory specs. Yes, it is the same car it was when it was new, but it's better. That is God's goal for restoring this broken world. In place of what we see now will be a new heaven and a new earth. And it will be better than the original. Why is God doing this? Because he loves his creation. We are made in his image. We are his creation and he loves us. And so Romans 8.28 does not mean that all things are good, but rather God is redeeming all things. 
He is making all things new. Isaiah 43, 19 says, Behold, I am going to do something new. Not it will spring up. Will you have, uh, will you be aware of it? I even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Revelations 21, 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. God is taking all of creation, even the broken stuff, and renewing and redeeming it. And so we should not take Romans 8.28 and use it to try to console ourselves or others that any trials or tragedies will ultimately result in success, that God will turn things around or that even failures and losses are somehow good. Rather, we should focus on the more important truth that God is bigger than all of our tragedies, all of our losses, and all of our failures. God is bigger than all of our tragedies, all of our losses, and all of our failures. In fact, in Christ's death and resurrection, God entered into our brokenness and redeemed it all. You and I do not live by chance. As children of a sovereign God, we live secure and under His control. Trust. Trust Him to carry you through whatever trial is standing in your way. God has a plan. There are so many valuable lessons we can take away from the story of Naomi and the book of Ruth that deeply impact our lives and our daily walk with Christ. Naomi's story is a wonderful picture of who God is during the hard times and how we should react to the storms in our own lives. Naomi in the Bible shows us that God is in control. If you get only one thing out of the story of Naomi and Ruth in the Bible, it should be that God is always in control. God is always in control. Even though we are living in a fallen world, God is in control. No matter how out of control it feels or how much we don't understand, the book of Ruth is a powerful reminder that God has a plan for our lives. I read this story in the Daily Bread a while back and it's titled God's Embroidery. It said, uh, when I was a little boy, my mother used to embroider a great deal. I would sit at her knee and look up from the floor and ask what she was doing. She informed me that she was embroidering. I told her that it looked like a mess from her I was. As from the underside, I watched her work within the boundaries of a little round hoop that she held in her hand, and I told her it sure looked messy from where I sat. She would smile at me, look down gently and say, my son, you go about your playing for a while, and when I'm finished with my embroidering, I will put you up on my knee and let you see it from my side. I would wonder why she would be using some of the dark threads along with the bright ones and why it seems so jumbled and 
messed up from my view. A few minutes would pass, and then I would hear my mother's voice say, Son, come sit on my knee. This I did only to be surprised and thrilled to see a beautiful flower. I couldn't believe it, because from underneath it looked so messy. Then my mother would say to me, My son, from underneath it did, it did look messy and jumbled. But what you didn't realize is that there was a pre-drawn plan on the top. It was a design. I was only following it. Now look at it from my side and you'll see what I was doing. He later on when later said, Many times through the years I have looked up to my Heavenly Father and said, What are you doing? And he answered, I'm embroidering your life. I say, but it looks like a mess to me. It's so jumbled. The threads seem so dark. Why can't they be bright? The father seems to tell me, my child, you go about doing my business and one day I will bring you to heaven and put you on my knee and you will see the plan from my side. Naomi and Ruth's story tells us that God can redeem every situation. God redeemed all the loss in Naomi's life and also blessed Ruth because of her faithfulness and love. If hardship hadn't driven her family to Moab, she would have never met Ruth. And if loss hadn't sent her back to her homeland, Ruth never would have met Boaz and entered the lineage of Christ. Never underestimate what God can do with your faithfulness. Never underestimate what God can do with your faithfulness. Naomi's story shows us that God is at work in the hard times. Another big takeaway from the book of Ruth is that God is still at work in the hard times. We may not be able to see it or we may not be able to feel his hand at work, but he's there. The book of Ruth shows us that our Heavenly Father is a loving God during the storms as well when life is smooth sailing. God's power does not stop when a storm is on the radar. Naomi reminds us of who we need to go to in the time of trouble. Naomi reminds us of who we need to call on when life is hard. People and things will not always be there for us. But even in our darkest hour, God is with us, directing our steps. We need to lean on God, press into him when life feels like it's going to break us. We must trust God and let him see us through. The book of Ruth reminds us to be honest with God. Naomi was honest with God, not as if he didn't already know what was in her heart, and yet there is power in vocalizing how you're feeling and what's going on in your heart in prayer. In the book of Ruth, we see what faith during hard times looks like. Naomi's life was not easy. All of the grief and pain that she had experienced made her bitter. But even still, her faith in God remained. God is like a puzzle of a beautiful landscape. 
God knows the big picture in our lives. Like the Rembrandt picture we were talking about last week, he holds the end result and can see all the shapes and colors of the big picture. Yet he only gives us one piece of the, pu of the puzzle at a time. He knows what we can handle and he does not want to overwhelm us. So he guides us through as we see how God has made everything to fit and fall in place into his plan. When we truly trust, trust the puzzle designer and place our lives in his hands and hold on to hope, knowing that in the end, things will work out even if it's not the way we desired. The best we can do is to live one day at a time and let God be in control. If you scan through the genealogy of Jesus, you'll find a long list of fathers, but you also see a few names of women. In Matthew 1.5, we read Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. So what does the book of Ruth have to do with us? Well, we all need a kinsman redeemer who will do whatever it takes to help us. This story of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz is a picture of how Jesus redeems us. Jesus is the ultimate kinsman redeemer who voluntarily paid the price for our debt and takes us as his bride. While well, I was writing this, I, I thought of Ephesians 5, verses 23 through 32, where it's the classic husbands love your wives, but there's really a kinsman redeemer in that message. So let me read that. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Okay, ladies, wait. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water of the word, that he might present himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands, also ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are all parts of the body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this mystery is great but I am speaking with reference to Christ in the church revelations 19 7 let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him because the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride has prepared herself We deserve to face God's punishment for our sin. We all fall short. We all fall short and can't pay the debt. But by trusting in Christ, 
the punishment that we all have coming to us has been taken on by Jesus. He paid our debt on the cross. Listen, Jesus being the Son of God has overpaid. He overpaid for our entire life's sins all once and for all. Believe the good news and draw near to your Savior today. The Word of God declares to you that you can have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Today, whether you uh, today in the face of whatever you need help with, you can draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having your heart freed from an evil, sin-stained conscience and receive his tender mercies and grace and help for your needs. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us reproach God with, sincere, with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, from, from, uh, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 4, 16. Therefore, let's approach the throne of, of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. So let me illustrate what I'm trying to say here. Imagine if you borrowed $50,000 from a creditor and as time goes by, you find that you cannot possibly ever be able to pay the money back. Then one day, a friend who is a billionaire hears about your debt and he gives you a million dollars so that you, you can pay off your creditor. Now, what has that friend done? Well, because he loves you, he has overpaid your debt to make sure that you will never feel debt in your heart again. And that creditor no longer has reason to harass you anymore. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You see, personally, I think it is easy to forget that we have been adopted, bought and paid for into the family of God, just like Ruth, with all the rights and privileges and protections. I love the song, Jesus Paid It All. And I'm going to Recite the lyrics to the song. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. <sighs> he washed me white as snow. And now complete in him my robe, his righteousness, close sheltered neath his side, 
I am divinely blessed. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change a leper's spots and melt a heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He's washed it white as snow. From the dying bed, my ransomed soul shall rise. Jesus died, my soul to save, shall render the vaulted skies. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in, in him complete, I lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Our sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. One last thought I, I read, was reading, I think, that Paul Tripp must have been thinking about the book of Ruth when he wrote these words. The good news of the kingdom is not freedom from hardship, suffering and loss. It is the news of a Redeemer who has come to rescue me from myself. His rescue produces change that fundamenta fundamentally alters my response to these inescapable rea realities. The Redeemer turns rebels into disciples fools into humble listeners. He makes cripples walk again. In him, we can face life and respond with faith, love, and hope. And as he changes us, he allows us to be part of what he is doing in the lives of others. As you respond to the Redeemer's work in your life, you can learn to be an instrument in his hands. In, embedded in, a, in the larger story of redemption is a principle that we must not miss. That God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things in the lives of others. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. And even though it was written thousands of years ago, it is still so fresh and new. And that we can go to it as a handbook for our lives. Father, we thank you that you are so thankful that you love us. Amen.